Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back for another episode of the Crystal Cocoon. I'm Jesse Dujari and with my co-host Brandon Lapierre. We thought we would do an episode today about winter solstice, kind of what about how we use the energy of the solstice, how it impacts us. Um, we also thought we'd talk a little bit about what's coming up in the next year, uh, 2016. There's lots of lots of different information coming up about that, and people are very curious about it. What do you have to say about that? <laughs> uh, which part? Well, we were going to start with talking about the winter solstice. Yeah, I figured we start there, and then we go into uh, the changes, mm-hmm. you know, predictions, changes, like what to expect in 2016. Yeah. But starting with the winter solstice, of course, is that's the uh, that's the near near event. <laughs> <laughs> So I was looking up online, you know, the scientifically what's happening, the perspective of, of what's creating the winter solstice. And I learned something that I didn't know, mm. that the winter solstice is the same all around the planet. It's not like in Australia, they have winter, uh, the summer solstice right now. It's mm. actually also the winter solstice there. That's interesting. Isn't that interesting? I thought between the two hemispheres, they would be different. But I had to look it up a few different places to confirm it. I even looked up when is the winter solstice in Zimbabwe. (laughs) (laughs) And it is also December 22nd. And this year, it's also on the 22nd of December instead of the 21st, which I thought was interesting. Is that because of the leap year? No, next year's the leap year. Oh, next year's the leap year. Well, why would it be the, the change in the date? I'm not sure. It was well. It was it was a very complicated answer, <laughs> uh, in in relationship to uh, the orbit and uh, going around the sun, our traveling around the sun, and um, our uh, our inclination. Um, and I I was also reading about. So I was looking up, trying to find information, you know, because we hear about how the uh, angle, the axis is that of our planet has been changing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was looking up online and trying to find where's that, like, where's some evidence of that? Like, where are they showing or citing scientific references that say that that's happened? And so basically, they there's a lot of controversy. And the ones that I was seeing that was discounting that um, our axis has tilted, uh, they were all basically over-exaggerating the whole th- concept. They were saying, oh, yeah, they said it, it, it tilted by 25 degrees. Come on, people, our sky would be completely different if it t- tilted by that much. Oh, yeah. 25 degrees is a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> but what they were actually saying is that it really only shifted by a few inches. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was doing that over a period of the last 10 years. So then I found an article in Natural News uh, where they were referencing how NASA did state that we did have a change in our incl- in our um, angle of inclination, but that the Inuit tribes, the the native tribes in, that live in the, around the Arctic, uh, they've been saying for the last several years that we're changing, that it's right. shifting. Uh, and the biggest shift I was reading about came about when in in, two, in April twentieth in two thousand eleven when there was the um, when Japan had that massive 8.5 earthquake, it shifted by eight feet. Right, it, the that's, whole con- that's pretty significant. It's huge. Yeah. And that caused a big change in our rotational pattern and our or, uh, inclination. So I thought that was really fascinating. I, I, I read that uh, the article with the Inuit talking about the, the, the shift. Mm-hmm. Um, what they were basing, basing their perception of a shift in the, in the axis was on the weather, though. Mm-hmm. Because they track the weather, and they they've been doing so for hundreds of years, to in order to like base their uh, the night the sky the Inuit on their hunts and stuff like that. Right. And um, they're saying the weather patterns have shifted, and and the the sun it's it's warmer throughout the day. The thing with that though is that you can't you can't count that all uh, specifically on an axis. Uh, change. Well, what they talk about is that actually where the moon and the sun have been coming up on the horizon line uh, has changed over the last 10 years. Well, yeah, that's true. Yeah, the NASA, and, NASA has, has that I right. think, statistics and stuff on the website. Mm-hmm. So NASA has some, um, some information talking about how we actually have shifted over the last couple of years, a couple inches. Mm-hmm. And They were um, saying it was four inches during that earthquake in Japan. We tilt, mm-hmm. The tilt shifted by four inches. Mm-hmm. And then it's been continued. Various events have caused more and more shifts, including some earth, uh, volcanoes in Italy and some earth, other earthquakes around in the Pacific Rim. 
Yeah. It, well, the the uh, I did see some information too. Um, basically, the uh, electromagnetic spectrum of the Earth and the way it, it pops up in these little patterns mm-hmm. that has shifted yeah. too, and it has right. to do with uh, the tilt and the rotation. Um, and then what we were just talking about in Adronis with with that uh, mm-hmm. channeling, what came right. through was that there is not going to be some pole reversal, and that was what right. you were just saying. saying magnetic uh, polar yeah, reversal. Uh, there's more dramatic shifts. Um, it's a physical pole change, yeah. and not a reversal, but an adjustment. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. There's a, I, I have seen different uh, different theories on that based on the way that electromagnetic grid has changed right because it, it's it comes up spotty all over in certain right. places we have several north pole minor north pole mm-hmm. polar spaces regions showing right. up around the planet yeah. right exactly mm-hmm. yeah and, and so, then gaps where there's no polarity mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. because of that shift and the change mm-hmm. and that that's been over uh the last couple of years that's what they're saying is that it, it could lead to a magnetic shift well, and there was a documentary I watched years ago. Um, it, it was it was actually, I think it was like an Oregon field guide. Uh, and it was set over in eastern Oregon at what's called the Steens Mountains. Mm. Uh, and in Oregon, most of our mountains are all cornical. They're all uh, volcanically formed. But the Steens Mountains are tectonically formed. So they actually have a, the plate lifts up. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they're one of those mountains where it's all smooth on one side and you can drive all the way to the top at 9,000 feet and look over the edge, you know, and then you're looking over this big playa. It's this great big desert, you know, that's cool. It's really cool. Uh, so there was a geologist who has, a, you know, he's been, he loves the Steens mountains and he climbs down that sheer face and studies the layers as they've been exposed. And what he's discovered, and he was one of the first that was in the science, in the geological community that was proposing this back in the nineties, I want to say it was, uh, he, he found there's a cycle to magnetic polar shifts that we actually go through them in a cyclical order. And it, he was saying it was about 125,000 years, mm-hmm. every 125,000 years we had one. And he could tell this because the way the sediment would, as the lava flow would come down, uh, on the land, because it's still very lava, lava volcanically active over there, uh, he, it, the metals in the lava, as it would cool, would all align in the direction of the pole. So he found there were positions, there were parts in the layers where they were all aligning chaotically. Mm -hmm. So he knew that had to be a time where it was unsettled and then they would line up again in a different direction. So he knew where the north, polar north was according to those layers. And so he said we're actually overdue for a magnetic polar shift. Um, Yeah, so it's interesting. And I don't know how that's going to play out, but it's fascinating. (laughs) There's a lot that speculate losing the magnetic field is what caused Mars to lose its atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Of course, then, according to Ladronis and some others, there's there's war <laughs> on Mars. Right, yeah. Yeah, which could also have caused the core to shut down it and could stop creating the, the poles. the magnetic, the magnetic uh, field to drop, if, yeah. you know, certain kinds of uh, weapon technology, like advanced uh, atomic energy weapons and stuff could, right. could the, up, upset the grid. They were also talking about, there's some talk about like crystalline energy, crystalline weapons that draw the energy from the core of the planet. Right, right. That was a huge one. Yeah. Uh, I think that, uh, that was Cronus part of the, mentioned, yeah, right? the, uh, I think that was what, of what destroyed Maldak or Ma- Mal- yeah. Maldak. Right. Uh, there in that in another documentary I was watching about the magnetic polar fields it was it was it was saying that it's the rotation of the core inside of the planet that creates our magnetic fields uh, that it's that spinning and so if something upsets that spinning enough of the core then it can cause a disruption in the magnetic fields hmm. which is all interesting so how does that impact us energetically do you have any ideas on that how does the shifting of the axis impact us energetically? Yeah, why? Why We talked with Adronis a little bit about why he said that our axis is shifting. And he was talking about tuning the planet. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, that, that makes sense to me because if you look at like, well, what did you just say? You said the cycle right. of shifting occurs every 125,000 years, right? Yeah, yeah. So that cycle correlates with the Mayan calendar. Oh, right. And so mm-hmm. it's it's about the long count is around mm-hmm. that time. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't remember specifically what it was, but I yeah. think it was 125,000 Yeah, years. I think you're right. 
And, and that's the time it takes to go around the galaxy, right? The right, Milky Way. Right. Mm-hmm. So there's a, there's a lot of correlation in the galactic cycles and mm-hmm. stuff like that with that magnetic shift that correlate with a shift in the energy uh, of the people, of the society. Uh, they mm-hmm. talk about that in the Mayans, of course. And then, oh, that would be like the Bronze Age, the Silver Age. The... Those are minor shifts, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, yeah, but there, there's, there's different... Um, uh, events that that change the way uh, society functions, mm-hmm. and uh, so yeah, we're we're in the middle of that. Of course, um, a lot of um, prophets have been talking about this time for a very long time, right? Right. Um, what was the the event in eighty seven? Harmonic convergence. Is that harmonic convergence? Oh, I'm not, I'm not familiar. It's not pop. Well, it's not popping up for me. Well, there there was a, a huge spiritual gathering, and uh, in, in 1987, it was I think it was called the Harmonic Convergence, and the 2012 that was called some other convergence, mm. and then we're coming up into um, some other another period, mm-hmm. and um, I think in, in 2027 it will be uh, the final shift into mm. this next period. Uh, which is interesting because that was that was something that was talked about in the Gene Keys uh, with Richard Rudd. Oh, those are fascinating. I love I love those. Um, Me too. I'm still only <laughs> I still haven't been able to read all of mine. <laughs> Ugh, too much information. But that that same that same um, philosophy, that same take, that same interpretation has also been talked about by Bashar. Mm-hmm. Uh, this period that we're going through from. 2012 and then specifically now we're heading up into 2016 and then into 2027 Mm -hmm. i think he said up till there and even through 2035 there's some more changes but by the time we get 2035 he said everything will be radically different Mm -hmm. um so as far as right now Mm -hmm. you know the 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 significance about this particular winter solstice so winter solstice is generally a time that you uh, withdraw into yourself, a time for deep introspection, a time for reflection, a time for letting go of, of all these um, ideas and notions that no longer serve you. And so a lot of a deep inner work, um, which has kind of been true for uh, a lot of people right now, doing their inner work and finding they need to, to go in more. Um, but that's, that's what the winter solstice is all about. Um, I also find that, um, and and I've been taught uh, that the winter solstice is is also time for planning, mm-hmm. uh, planting of seeds of ideas and dreams for the next year, uh, setting of intentions for what you want to accomplish. Just as if you were a farmer, you would prepare your fields and then go in for the winter, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you wait and you figure out how do I want my beds to lay out? What worked last year? What didn't work last year? What do I want to change? So, um, you know, this is also a very good time energetically to start setting those intentions. And right. as you're clearing away, the, the good thing about setting your intentions is it brings up your issues. Right, exactly. <laughs> it brings up your challenges. You're like, oh, but I can't do that because of blah, blah, blah. Well, now you have nothing else to focus on. So mm-hmm. <laughs> you can focus on that blah, blah, blah. <laughs> the blah, blah, blah. The blah, blah, blah. That's inhibiting <laughs> you. <laughs> mm-hmm. We all want to get rid of blahs. Yeah, yeah, nobody wants to be blah. No one wants to be blah. <laughs> and if you do, well, I'm sorry. Well, we need yeah. to hang out, and then you won't be blah anymore. <laughs> I think that's uh, blocks is what we call those. Blocks. <laughs> blocks. <laughs> yes. Oh, blocks. Blockages. <laughs> I was reading about kind of some other um, winter solstice traditions from around the world. And uh, I was uh, in Japan. I thought this was interesting. In Japan, uh, they talk about it's the time of turning, the point of turning from yin into yang energy. Mm. Uh, And so it's a very uh, pivotal point where the energies are balanced and they have a, uh, they have a ritual of taking a bath with a yuzuyu fruit, which is like a type of citrus fruit. It's kind of like a great big orange slash lemon. And you're supposed to slice it and put it in a bag and put it in your bath. And then that is supposed to purify and um, and bring all the good energy and balance. And it's good for your skin and all of that. And then you drink this um, 
then you eat this special squash <laughs> uh, called uh, kombucha, which I thought was also interesting. K- kombucha? No, kombucha. Kombucha. Kombucha, yeah. Oh, I like kombucha. I do too. I <laughs> <laughs> on the day of the winter solstice, you're supposed to eat this particular squash, which is very full in vitamins and carotene. So um, they have all these traditions around foods that you're supposed to eat and ways of detoxing and cleansing the body to go into the new year, which I thought was pretty cool. You know, another thing that's interesting that I was just listening to, um, have you you listened to... Um, any of Matt Kahn, you said, I think I have listened to some Matt Kahn. Mm-hmm. Have you listened to the one about the, uh, the Pleiades, uh, prophecy, or the Pleiadian prophecy? Yes. Yeah, like well, I've heard, well, I've heard a lot of the Pleiadian prophecies through their channels. There's a couple of different, uh, channels that, um, just broadcast the prophecies, but I don't know that I, I haven't heard Matt Kahn talking about them. No. Yeah. I, I I haven't really listened to a, a whole lot of those. I think I, I did like many, many years ago, mm-hmm. uh, but not since then. But I did listen to a Matt Kahn uh, talk recently that was talking about the Pleiadian prophecy. And something interesting that he was talking about is that um, the what he was saying kind of goes along the lines of a few different theories. One is the, the holographic universe and that the earth being uh, basically a holographic projection from the Pleiadians and them being like the origins of um, souls, like souls originate there and, mm. and in their basically uh, dream exploration projected mm-hmm. themselves into this holographic earth to grow through these experiences. Mm-hmm very matrix like matrix like it is very matrix like mm-hmm. I, I found that interesting i was like hmm he didn't specifically say the holographic earth but that's what i i, I gleamed out of it when mm-hmm. he was saying that i was like oh there's a correlation there wouldn't that be interesting um mm. the thing that i i found interesting too is that uh it, just bringing it up now is that uh winter solstice is generally a time for alignment with the the pleiades mm. so you're you're galactically aligned with the pleiades and i think stonehenge was was built to align with those stars when the winter solstice comes up. Oh, very interesting. Yeah, so a time for renewal, a time mm-hmm. for reflection, a time for planning, a time for, for new things to emerge out of mm-hmm. that stillness. Yeah. And then being aligned with the, the Pleiades, which he's saying is the origins of the souls. Well, it's interesting. I, I could tell a story, but I won't get into it too much. But uh, there was a, a dream, uh, a dream slash communication that happened with my mom, my brother and I, and um, and uh, where we had communication with the Pleiadians. And they basically told us that, that uh, they said, you know, we've destroyed our planet. This is how we did it. You know, and now we've been trying to figure out how to not do it again. And you're our children. And, and we're trying to, they wanted to share the messages of how, what they've learned with us, you know, in this dream communication. Did you say that it was a, as a dream with about, well, well let me, so, <laughs> did this happen between all three of you? Yeah. Yeah. Separately. Yes. So basically what had okay. ha- it was, I think I told this story actually. Uh, it was that my, my mom and my brother and I, we were all living in Big Sur, uh, mm-hmm. California and my mom had a dream. So she had this dream and in the dream, somebody came and said, you know, it's time for us to go, Mikey. And she's like, but I have the kids. And there's like, don't worry, I'll get them. You get dressed. Uh, And so she was getting dressed. And then this guy came back and he had me in his arm and my brother was holding his hand. And, um, and then she said that he said, beam me up, Scotty. And so I I think I told this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So basically he took us on his ship back to the Pleiades and to his, his home planet, because there were several planets in the system uh, and talked about how they destroyed it. And in the planet, I can't remember the specifics at this time. It was, there's a couple of suns and a couple of moons and the landscape was all very specifically colored well the next morning my brother comes running in when you know he's sure he hears my mom stirring and he goes mommy mommy wasn't that amazing dream we had and he had drawn that landscape in a picture Mm. so i was very young i was like uh, one and a half two and she said that um i was not i was kind of one of those kids that didn't like 
people to pick me up. Like I, I wasn't, I wasn't super trusting. I liked people, but um, she said he was holding me, and I was really comfortable and <laughs> just very happy. And when we got on the ship, um, another woman came and took me out of his arms, and I went right to her, like I knew her. Uh, and my brother went to her, and we went to a separate place. Then my mom went with him, and. Yeah, um, I would have dreams about it, but I don't know how much of that was because of hearing the stories and how much of that was recollection. But there were other other kind of stories like that in our family and our history. So he had talked a lot about that, basically. That's interesting. That was back in the 70s. <laughs> Far out. Interesting. Yeah, I remember if, as a child, you know, I would talk to people about the Pleiadians. And people thought I was crazy. Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so I the learned who? to stop talking about them. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I never talked about my experiences to. Yeah. You learned how to. I had one friend that, you know, that I would talk about things with, but mm -hmm. he was also the one that we would, uh, he would come over and we would sit outside my window and smoke joints. <laughs> There's that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, watch the, the stars move right before we smoke people thank you <laughs> yeah yeah i had one of those friends too yeah yeah they usually involved some sort of intoxicant yeah, yeah. well some other traditions about the um the winter solstice that i was reading about in and in, in um, africa in the hoodoo tradition uh they do blessings all around money and spiritual growth as well so it's interesting that this day, all around the country, wherever we look, has similar themes of blessings, similar themes of traditions. Um, so it really does show there is something in the energy mm -hmm. that, that, that leads humans into this sort of sphere of behavior. Yeah, no coincidence. Right, right, right. right. So it's, it's very cool. So uh, there's lots of different rituals and lots of different practices I found online that, you know, you can, you can look up if you're curious about rituals and practices. I personally am not a very ritualistic person. Um, I don't, I don't really, other than meditation, I don't really do a daily practice. Like I think that I'm more responsive to kind of what happens on a daily basis. Um, but I do like to at the, around the new year mark, I do like to sit down and kind of just journal out what I'm doing, where I'm at, yeah. what I want to accomplish, where I'm going and just kind of give myself that outline of the year of what I think. And then I love to look back at it at the end of the year. Now that's a great meditation to do during the solstice is to sit down and like review your year. Yeah. Like, where did I go? What was I setting out to do? What mm -hmm. didn't I do? What would I like to do differently? What could I do like to do next year? Mm -hmm. And then I think, I think that's a great point to, uh, to come back to is, as setting your intention, yep. you know, for the next year, setting your intention for what you would like to grow, mm -hmm. um, both in your own life and, in your garden and mm -hmm. in the planet. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we, we mentioned is that Bashar said that uh, 2016 is the year everything will change. Mm -hmm. He said it more, much more emphatically. It was like, the year everything <laughs> will change. <coughs> you, know, you know Bashar. But, um, <laughs> we love it. I love Bashar. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, he, very enthusiastically, the year everything will change. And so... Um, what what do, what we have here, like lining up, how looking at all the events um, around, we kind of we kind of see evidence of change. Yeah. Uh, for the first time, we have a uh, presidential first time in a long time, at least, we have a presidential candidate that actually cares about people, and um, it it doesn't seem to be a big showboat. You know, he's not doing it strictly to appease people to get votes. He's not doing it to um, put on a big masquerade. He, you know, he, he answers questions straightforward and honest. Mm -hmm. And um, he generally wants to see the people empowered. So I think that's um, that right there, to me, is a significant difference from what we've seen before. Mm -hmm. Where, you know, Obama built up a lot of false hope. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you, if you look at the, the other circumstances around there, there was a lot of questionable things so for the first time, there's not a whole lot of questionable things uh, around this candidate. Um, as far as like other world events, all around the world, uh, people are taking back their power. Mm -hmm. All around the world, you have uh, protests and, and people rejecting 
um, big um, corporations like Monsanto. Right. All of the different countries and cities and mm-hmm. states that are suing Monsanto. Yep. Now, he, now, here, now here in the U.S. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Even uh, in the U.S. So they still got... Spokane. Wasn't that the first one? In Washington. Spokane, Washington, I think, was the first I heard about a city suing Monsanto. And then San Diego and... The, there's been some other ones that have I know sprung in Hawaii up. there was one. Yeah, in Hawaii mm-hmm. they're suing for. Um, oh, there was another country that was suing. Yeah, to, I want to say it was Switzerland or Sweden or I can't remember somewhere in the EU. EU. And there's another country that was also suing uh, one of the pharmaceutical companies for um, uh, the poisons in the in the vaccines. Oh, and there was uh, in another country there was a release of um, a, a doctor came out and. Uh, I can't remember who he was, some sort of chemist who working for one of the pharmaceutical companies talking about how they know, they know the flu vaccine does not work, doesn't do any positive benefits at all for people. Yeah. And he's admitting that they've been still giving it to people and pushing it. Well, that information has been... And even this year, the flu vaccine was recalled. Really? Yes. They said that, oh, sorry, this year's batch is no good. Well, that, that's a first. I know. Past, I've never have, heard of that. In the past, before. they would have flung it out there anyway. Right. Uh, but, you know, that information has been out there for a long time. It has. Yeah. All the studies and the results showing that it's ineffective, mm-hmm. uh, the ineffectiveness of those vaccines has been out there for a very long time. Yeah. Dr. McCullough talks about a lot about the ineffectiveness of vaccines, especially the flu vaccines and the science behind it. Mm-hmm. Uh, most people aren't versed enough in the science to know what to look for and how to even question it. Right. They don't know what to believe. Right. They don't know how to tell which studies were pr- conducted with, you know, with all all proper places, all proper, um, you know, variables in place with control groups and, you know, all sorts of, uh, all those sorts of parameters that keep a study viable. Mm-hmm. Uh, so people don't, you're right, they don't know how to find the information they're looking for, how to back up what they're hearing or how uh-huh. to question what they're hearing. So they either just unquestioningly adopt these things or they unquestioningly deny them. <laughs> right. They, Both of which aren't going to serve anybody. No, they're not going to serve anybody at all. Mm-hmm. You, you have to be willing to do a little due diligence. Right. <laughs> And uh, back up your thoughts because right. most people like they'll 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 just they're listen mindless. To, they'll mindless and listen to hearsay. Yeah, we were on the bus. Uh, oh gosh, I want to say it was last year, and there was a guy and he was reading this book and he was and he was like intentionally covering the cover so you couldn't see what the book was, mm-hmm. which only makes me curious, you know. So I'm sitting across from him and I was like, "Do you mind if I ask what book you're reading?" And so he shows me, and it was basically a debunking. The it was talking about the how the the uh, leftists have gone just as bad as the extreme rightists have gone, you know. Yeah. Uh, and so it was kind of confronting these truths. And I was like, far out, that looks like a great book. And so my husband starts talking with him about, you know, the whole climate change and how it's, you know, human induced and and all of these different things and how he's saying that that's not true. Uh, he's like, no, no, it's not. And and the guy said, yeah, there's actually quite a bit of evidence about that. So they're they're discussing these things, right? Well, this woman who is sitting down four or five rows away from us, she starts yelling across the bus, you guys are ignorant. I can't believe how ignorant you are. And she's going on and on about how they have no proof to back it up. And how can they be so ignorant that they deny all the facts of global warming and climate change and, and the CO2 levels and, and their, and their footprints and all of these things. And she actually is evidence. I know not only that, but what we were talking about was how you can't even have the discussion with people because about it because they get like, she's getting emotional and she jumps up and starts doing exactly. Exactly, serving exactly the point. And there's there's people emotional, like emotional. And radical on both sides of the fence. They are. You're you're either not you're you're not uh, you don't care about the planet, right? Or you're just buying into right. the corporate control BS, and it's just all propaganda. Right. So there's people on both sides of the fence yelling back and forth at each back other. Back and forth, yeah. And if you really look at it. There's evidence for both. Exactly. There's evidence because there's change. Because I used to think this too. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, well, if there's evidence for change in the climate all throughout the solar system mm-hmm. in every planet. Yeah. It, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not an isolated event. So, therefore, mm-hmm. it, it's not 
a human caused thing. Mm -hmm. But if you look at some of the other uh, scientific studies, scientific being the keyword here, scientific studies, it does show evidence of like accelerated carbon uh, carbon emissions causing an impact. But the difference between what's already occurring as far as like uh, historical occurrences and the the shifts uh, from fossil records Mm -hmm. on climate change being one part of the natural cycle, it's amplified due to the yes. contribution of of human input right and so we have about a 30 percent difference mm-hmm. um in impact based on the human influence than it would be otherwise they would still be a change yeah you know we we do have in addition to all the carbon imprint we do have um weather modification and that right. that was huge yeah Weather modification is huge, and mm-hmm. there's definitely evidence of that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, we're, <laughs> you have right. to look at all of those things. Yeah. If you're talking about global impact, what is the bigger picture? So there's 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 chemtrails, weather modification, and yes, that stuff is out there. The evidence is out there. It's no longer tinfoil hat theory. Mm-hmm. It's it, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> tinfoil hat. That brings that brings to mind the Weird Al song. Aluminum foil. Remember that song? <laughs> Where at the end there's like the Illuminati and the reptoid. Oh, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> I love that song. It's called aluminum foil. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's better than just wrapping your leftovers. You can protect your brain. <laughs> the aluminum foil. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, there is a an interesting t- thing too. I was uh, we were talking with Adronis just recently, mm-hmm. and um, one of the things that he was saying is that we're really coming to a part in our world where, first of all, we've we have we have poisoned our planet, absolutely, and and it's we've done so so that we can learn to never do it again. You know, mm-hmm. as humanity, to 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 never do this again to a planet, never just you know, rape the planet with no thought or concern to the impact on the larger, larger body of the earth. So that when we go out and become spacefaring culture, we don't create this problem on other planets that we come to <laughs> just destroy one and then go on to the next one, which I think is also interesting because look at how much of our sci-fi that we write or read uh, that's written by humans is about these cultures that go and just destroy one planet after another, consume one planet after right. another, after another. And now they've come for Earth. I just watched one. <laughs> well, <laughs> nice. you know, it, it's, that's the thing about um, very human media perspective. and stories and stuff is we play these out. Yeah. It, it's, I guess it's the, the human way of projecting, isn't it? Right. You know, we, we, we create stories about other people doing it. They're doing it's it not to us. us. Right. <laughs> I love how when we were talking with Adronis, he said something about it's it, the, the pop, repopulating of the earth with the Atlanteans from Mars was no different than the Spanish settlers, what the Spanish settlers did in North America. Oh, that's true. Yeah. And it's very, very, very true. So he was also talking about how uh, what we're doing right now is we're not only are we coming to a point where we're purging this destruction of our environment from the human populace, from our uh, what's acceptable in our mm-hmm. culture, but we're also purging from our culture bigotry, racism, elitism, you know, that idea of separate and not equal. You know, that's, that's a huge thing that I see uh, as part of this shift in the coming year. I agree. Is that the information is out there and available in order for us to become more empowered with the decisions that allow us to make the change, to allow us to make different decisions. So part of that that goes along with this environmental changes is part of the uh, corporate propaganda has been to say, yes, there is, because there is a propaganda there. Oh, for sure. And so, we're, we, we, <laughs> yeah, we're not saying there isn't. There is one. There but is, what yeah. is the truth? Like get mm-hmm. through the layers and the clouds to get to the truth of what the propaganda Propaganda really is so. Part of it, what you can see is there's this this attempted shift from uh, corporate responsibility to the individual. Mm-hmm. It's like saying, "Oh, if you would just do this, then the, the earth would be a, a lot better." Oh, it's like what they did in California, uh-huh. where ninety some odd percent of the water is being consumed by fracking and agricultural, industrial and agricultural. And yeah. what are they doing? They're putting restrictions on the residents. Yeah, they yeah. they <laughs> increased their allowance for yeah. fracking. Right, and fracking really and they're out of water. Really doesn't benefit. <laughs> no, 
really doesn't benefit anybody. No. In fact, there's there's some satellite imagery of all of uh, Texas, Arizona, all the way across to California, mm-hmm. uh, where they're showing that the earth is steaming. And it's because they're pumping the water into this into the ground to to push the oil up uh-huh. it's it's the most retarded thing i've i'm sorry it's just ridiculous well, it causes all kinds of problems not only so with, with the local water that right. they do have yeah. you're going to get uh, seepages from the chemicals they use in the fracking into right. the into the uh, the local water so it poisons the whole land area mm-hmm. and then the water that does spring up it's poisonous to the animals so right. it's poisonous to the wildlife it's poisonous to the humans mm-hmm. it destroys the environment for a very long time yeah. all for the sake of a, an increase in a couple points in their profits well and not only that but you know the idea I still find it absurd that people call it fossil fuels because <laughs> it's it's not fossil fuels, folks. It's it's the lubricant of our planet. It is oil is the lubricant that allows the continents and allows the 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 larger masses of of rock body to slip around against each other. And now what we're doing is removing it all from the planet. So yeah, look, we're having these big massive earthquakes. We're having harder sticking points, earthquakes in places we didn't expect, tons of earthquakes and all over in Texas and Oklahoma and the Southwest where there were never earthquakes before. It's not a volatile range, but it is now because there's no more lubricant left in the planet, in that region of the of the area. That's also one of those things it's, it's hard to pinpoint what the cause is because mm-hmm. we have these natural shifts in the axis like we're talking about before. Right. So how does that impact it? In addition to how much uh, stress are we humans putting on the planet by extracting all the things like the fossil fuels that you're saying? Yeah, but there are studies that show fuels. that there's since they started, when they start doing fracking, it takes a certain period of time before earthquakes start showing up in the region. Hmm. Same thing's happening in Russia. Uh, everywhere they're fracking, they're starting to have and they're they're not big quakes they're yeah. micro tremors uh-huh. and they're happening in rippling succession in areas where fracking is occurring we know it causes these problems it's just that we don't want to accept it because we think we need the fuel yeah, I haven't I haven't heard that study uh, before I'll you mentioned it right I'll, now, but I'll that makes that the, makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember reading about it last year because mm. I was talking with a woman from Texas and she was telling me about this. How there's all these earthquakes, and I was like, "Really? I never heard of earthquakes in Texas." And she said it's because of the fracking. And she was t- and she told me about this, and I was reading about it. It's fascinating. Mm-hmm. I mean, we know it's it's causing problems. The sad thing is, is we have had alternative technologies since the 1800s. We could use steam. We could use electric. We had electric cars before we had the gas combustion engine and steam engines. And yeah, we're not going to all burn coal and and wood, but there are... (laughs) And those are just the technologies that we know about. about. Exactly. Not including any of the the 6,000 plus uh, classified right. patents and how many of those are on energy <laughs> technologies. You know, right, the, exactly. There, there's a lot there <clears throat> that we just don't know about. Yeah, so I think 2016 is going to be kind of about reclaiming personal power, reclaiming mm-hmm. personal responsibility. I think we're going to be doing a lot more of building relationships, building communities. I hear so many people talking about wanting more community, wanting to feel more connected, right. really feeling the impact of isolation yeah. where I would say the early 2000s were all about isolatory behavior you know don't go out here's your cell phone get on your computer but now we're actually seeing people posting stuff and making videos about you know mocking that culture of constantly staring at the screen we're hearing people using words like screen staring society and we're starting to see people go oh we are also starting to see a lot more people addicted to their phones <laughs> Mm-hmm. But uh, so I think I think it'll be good. I'm I'm looking forward to that part of the year. Uh, there's also uh, I was reading something about how um, what was it Sagittarius is uh, no uh, what was it Saturn is moving into Sagittarius, which is also supposed to yeah for 2015 through 2018, which is all about restructuring relationships in the education center system and internal rela- internal relationships. Um, so we have a lot of other energies that are kind of supporting this and and starting right. to create that influence as well. Yeah, restructuring relationships. You know, that that's, um, goes right into uh, how you are looking at your leaders, the relationship you have with your government, your your all of that. Um, it, it makes sense that 
that uh, the time is now that we have the candidate that we do. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what I'm looking at. So, I, <laughs> of course, we also have... Always bringing it back to the politics. I, I, I have to. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, folks. We'll just have to wait till 2016 is over and then, then he'll move on. <laughs> then, you, then you really will hear me move on. Kind of. <laughs> then I will probably be more like, all right, people, get your asses out there. <laughs> As we approach November, Brandon will be like, I will drive you to the poll. <laughs> I have extra stamps for the mail-in states. <laughs> it's okay. We love you anyway. <laughs> oh, thank you. No, I, I was talking about um, the interesting thing that I was seeing is like on a very physical, tangible level is, is displayed here and the two polarities that are being amplified right now. <laughs> you mean Bernie Sanders versus Donald Trump. Right. Oh, God. We're going to have this conversation, aren't we? <laughs> we? We are. We are. <laughs> you know, uh, some of the things I was I was reading about and David Wilcock talks about early on mm. is that the, the two polarities yeah. of the splitting of the earth. You, you talked about, have you heard about that? You, yeah. Yeah. So uh, talking about like, and he was, what he was saying is the information he got is actually now is the time that that splits starts now is the time not really 2012 but but after and uh, he's talked about in that one of his lectures that i was listening to and so it's now that that split begins between the two polarities in the earth and then somehow some way it will be some form of physical split or the appearance of a physical split if we're talking about holographic earth theory right oh mm -hmm. and so the split of this earth into so two polarities be the trump land and, and the bernie land exactly <laughs> So on one hand, you're going to have the Trump land should get like the Siberian desert <laughs> and the Mojave desert. Well, they're going to have their whole a whole planet to destroy. Oh right, a whole old planet to, have to create World War Three because Trump is going to have his his personal ego involved and his narcissistic personality is going to take offense at somebody else and, and then convince everybody that it's a good idea to go start a nuclear war with these people and then they're going to go, go back and forth and um, apocalypse is going to occur. I'm just speaking out of my ass here, folks, but I can imagine that. <laughs> Would be a scenario that might happen. So glad you said it, not me. <laughs> <laughs> then you got the other side, you know the uh, the potential beginning of uh, a humanitarian utopia. <laughs> <laughs> where people are empowered, they're making decisions for themselves, they're seeing through the lies and the BS, and they start holding hands and seeing kumbaya. <laughs> <laughs> and we have unicorns that fart purple rainbows. <laughs> right, right, and poop rainbow sherbet. That's you know? right, that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> Poof. Poof. <laughs> Hungry? Oh my God, that was the funniest commercial. Did you see that? The squatty potty, right? That's why I said it. Squatty <laughs> potty, oh my God, I love that thing. I so want one. <laughs> well, yeah. I totally want one, I do. It, it, they do make it look fun. I know. Pooping never looked so fun. Unicorn on the pooper. <laughs> I want to be a pooping unicorn. Come taste my sherbet. Just kidding. Ew. Ew. <laughs> uh, new year. The new year. Well, one thing I was new reading. New year. So, coming back. <laughs> coming back. Coming back on point. I have this day calendar, and I absolutely love this day calendar. It, I even bought the next year of it. It's called We Moon. And I'm, I tend to not be... Um, I. I I love women. I speak up for us, but I don't like the whole culture of trying to remove men from everything. And that's kind of a, a little bit how they do it, but yeah. they spell it W E apostrophe M O O N so instead of woman. Uh -huh. But it's basically a Gaia rhythms calendar and it's a day planner and it has all this other stuff in it. And I love that it has, you know, it has, um, uh, astrology information it has astronomy information it has um, the lunar charts it's it's very cool one of the things that it talked about was that um where was it uh, uranus is independent in aries uh no no that wasn't it it was talking about how yeah that uranus has moved into aries and that this attracts people to do drastic situation changes, cracking open the sky, making new generational changes. And that's been going, going to be continuing with, and with Neptune and Pisces, uh, from 2011 to 2025. 
and that that's going to be this radical change period, which is what we're seeing it, really it already seeing. for the mm-hmm. since 2011. So I'm like far out, and then I see the correlation ending in 2025. Right, lots of stuff ending in 2025, 27. I'm curious, yep. how old will I be? I forget, but. I'm curious. I'm very curious too to see how this all will unfold. I think it'll be fifty, <laughs> somewhere around there. Yeah, very, very curious. And 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 how will we look as a culture once we start to accept these things? So I would say for us as the individual, what do we do? We start recognizing as an individual, we influence our culture. We influence the culture around us, and we start embodying the culture we want to see around us. Uh Embody it in your home, embody it in your work, embody it with your friends. Be that what you want the world to be, and it will change. Looking at your your activities and the things that you're aligning mm-hmm. yourself with, whether it be your dietary habits, whether it be your, your whatever your Leave spending my diet ha- alone. <laughs> your spending habits, and uh, seeing how those align with your personal belief systems, you know it's it's mm-hmm. no longer uh, going to be acceptable to just turn the other way and turn turn your head and ignore things and put your hand, head in the sand. Mm-hmm. And that, that, I think that's what this is all about. It's like letting the truth come out because when, the more people are becoming aware of Monsanto and the effects of GMOs, that more studies have been revealed to the public and being accepted through the mainstream that GMOs are in fact unhealthy. It's been you know, <laughs> something that's been known right. for a long time, but now it's like, uh, yeah, you can't escape that fact anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the, it's, it's funny. They're actually talking about how the beginning part of the year next year is going to be all about addressing these public health issues. <laughs> Well, isn't that interesting? I know. See, you're just reading from my calendar, aren't you? Leave, leave my calendar with my alone. mind. <laughs> it's hiding behind the screen. You shouldn't be able to see it. But jeez. <laughs> yeah, but that I, I agree. I think that I, I'm finding that more and more people are starting to champion for not. You know, I hate this idea that we have to label food as being organic or as being pesticide free, as though what's normal food, what's the food that we've eaten since we evolved. I was so thankful yesterday. It's labeled as separate. Some, from bananas uh, that were gluten free. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, my husband and I crack up over some of the gluten free labeling on things. It'll be like chicken and it's all gluten free. We're like, uh, look, it's gluten free chicken, honey. <laughs> you know, well, hopefully. <laughs> I, I get, so, I like, I get, I get so like irritated when I see that. I'm like, do we really have to even right. like look out for that? But we do. But we do because they put the flour on the inside of packaging and crap. Uh huh. Yeah, and they 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 fluff chickens up with, with weird, weird crap weird stuff that makes the meat all like chunky and funky. Fill it with water so it weighs more. Right. Well, you know, it's funny. I was um, <laughs> we kind of hearkening back to our earlier conversation about tolerance and kind of you know getting too far to the left or too far to the right. Uh, there was a spiritual person who I follow on Facebook and, and uh, I, I just love his postings and he had posted something about how he was no tofurkey for me this year. I'm, I'm going to have a turkey this year. I'm having turkey this year. Well, he got blasted by all these people like, oh, how can you eat that turkey? And it's so evil and going on and on and on. And he was like, wow, can I just I mean, I'm just eating a turkey and your guys are going to just blast me about it. Like, you know, you can choose to not eat meat if you want to. But that's kind of what we've gotten to this point of where we have to, we're so insecure in what we feel. We're so insecure in our beliefs that we're willing to blast somebody else for not following our belief system. Mm -hmm. Because it's, what does that say about our belief system? If somebody else isn't following it that we respect and we like and appreciate so, you know, again, bring the focus back to you. <laughs> why are you so upset that this person is doing something different from what you are? Well, yeah. Why are you so upset? Yeah. Do you think it the whole thing is murder right. or is it just that the inhumane treatment of animals in general mm-hmm. in the way our factory farming and so forth and right. so forth and so forth? You don't really know what this guy is buying. Right. You have it, no idea what kind of turkey he just bought. He can, He could be doing the Portlandia thing, going right. out and buying the turkey that's been named, raising a good home and, yeah. and happy... <laughs> Happy free range yep. turkeys. That, that <laughs> I actually, my son, he's been in MMA for since he was six, and um, and there was one boy uh, who was he was 
awesome. This little kid was like, he was one of those just naturally born martial artists. By the way, I, I was being a little facetious, but I do think that <laughs> stuff matters. Yeah. Yeah, I'm being I do think it matters too. Yeah. But he rose his own turkeys in the backyard. They raised their own turkeys and mm-hmm. their dad let him cut the heads off. And so he had a samurai sword. And he goes, well, what you do is you go up and you go gobble, gobble, gobble. And the turkey will go gobble, 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 you know, and stick its neck out and then you whack it off. And he's like, my sword's so sharp, it just cuts right off. And I remember... He was like maybe 11 or 12 when he was telling me the story of the boy. And I was like, I'm sorry, you're beheading turkeys in your backyard with a samurai sword? <laughs> like, oh. And I was really struck by it. And it was really horrific feeling to me. But then I thought about it. I'm like, well, you know, that turkey lived in that backyard. It got loved and fed by those boys. And that samurai sword is sharp. <laughs> so I bet that thing didn't even know what happened to it. So we have this illusion it doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter. People are going to get offended or hurt no matter how the animals are treated. But we do, not to say that we don't need to address factory farming and, and the way that we're treating animals. It's We do need to address that. I'm not being flippant about that. But the way we're attacking each other, we need to not be attacking each other as individuals. We need to be attacking the factory farms. Right. <laughs> we need to be attacking, good, you know, Tyson, good. Dyson Meat Company. And if you, if you highlight that fact, and right. the, you know, some of the some of the organizations out there are actually doing a decent job of yes. highlighting that and not the individual right. saying if you are going to eat meat choose meat yeah. that has an ethical background yeah that's what we do and and i think that's that's really important because the more you do that and less focus on how demonizing the individual the more the individual is going to go along with yeah you maybe you're right mm-hmm. because they're not pe- feeling personally attacked right and the more people shift that way exactly. the more we can actually shift out of this this right. meat culture and into yeah. something that's more holistic healthier for the individual right. healthier for the planet healthier for the animals mm-hmm. the more you let, yeah, it just you need to shift the focus away from the individuals and the personal yeah. attacks. Otherwise, yeah. nothing will ever get to get solved. No, because if you're gonna, pointing your finger, going you, 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 you need to stop. Yeah, and go me. Wait, me. Yeah, <laughs> how can I do this different? Right, because the how use. Can I, where can I put my energy that's more effective? The use aren't there's a, use aren't working. No, this is what you're doing. That this that's not working. You're the only you in that. <laughs> you know, like the Native Americans and you know the the whole philosophy that was on uh, the movie Avatar. Oh, mm-hmm. the way they they went about their meat gathering is mm-hmm. they went out, they only selected what they needed, and they got this this kill, and then they respected the life of the kill after it was it was uh, gone. You know, mm-hmm. I, I see you, you're seeing the spirit of the animal, mm-hmm. and that's the way the Native Americans have typically done it um, historically in uh, in the United States before there was was settlers here mm-hmm. uh, i think there's there's something to that i mean i do see us shifting more into a plant-based culture because we have the availability the technology right the, the nutrients are out there well and we, we also really... know that we don't meat isn't isn't a complete nutrient anyway no i and, mean it's no more complete than beans are and we're finding out mm-hmm. that actually it's detrimental to the body yeah you know, and especially in the volumes that we consume it in this country. Yeah, I think the the FDA just released something that processed meats are actually carcinogenic. Oh, and then now we have the pink goo meat. Uh, well, we've had that for a while. It's, it's now I just we found out about that. That's the nastiest. Well, that's thing the key I've there. Now we found out about, about the pink goo oh. meat. Now we found out about what they've been feeding us. Ugh. Yeah, <laughs> I have to say, like, I, oh, God, I just, oh. but you know, <laughs> re- respecting the animal. It, it it does say a lot for the animals themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it changes it changes everything about it from the nutrients they get and, and so on. Uh, and also, it changes the biochemistry of the animal as it dies. <laughs> the, the animal actually respects you when mm-hmm. you respect it. Right. And the the thing I was going to say is, my mom. Um, I grew up on a farm. Mm-hmm. I couldn't stand butchering any of the animals. It mm-hmm. it, it it grossed me out. I, ugh. <laughs> well. I, I couldn't even do it. I couldn't even look at it. I had to go inside when my mom was butchering because that's how much it grossed me out. I know. I love it when your mom teases you. Yeah. And I didn't, even, I didn't <laughs> let alone, like, I didn't want really to think about eating rabbits or anything like that because she raised rabbits. I just thought that was, no, for, no, no. So I'll stick nope. to the basics that I'm used to and only because I'm used to it, but I don't need to go on beyond that. And then, um, but, uh, my mom raising chickens, though, she always, like, more the, the last time she raised them, she always raised them in a really ethical manner. 
and she always respected the animals and treated them kind of like pets. She'd go out and she had her pet chickens, she had her other chickens, and they're all together. Um, but when she went out and um, it was time to, to butcher one, she needed to kind of you know, get a meal. Mm-hmm. The other chickens would huddle in the she was corner. She some fried chicken. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the other chickens would huddle in the corner and there would be one that would slowly walk forward and very calmly, it, she would, it would let her pick it up. It wouldn't run from her. And it, it, they all knew basically what was going on. My mom was also very psychic too. And mm-hmm. she has a very good connection to her animals and her garden. So that connection, that respect, though, allowed the animals to kind of choose themselves and respect her back. Mm-hmm. And I, there's, there's, I think there's something important there. I agree. Yeah, I agree. We grew up on a farm too, but we didn't. Um, we were we were vegetarian, so we didn't. It was uh, we raised horses and chickens, chickens for eggs, mm-hmm. and um, and I remember there was one period where we lived behind a chicken farm, and it was my brother and I were enthralled every time it was time for slaughtering, and uh, just because we never saw anything like that, you know, we were raised very hippie and you know naturalistic we were my mom was over cooking some burgers on the grill that were made out of uh, vegetable plant protein and <laughs> egg and you know all tvp packed together um and and it and it was interesting because at that farm it was it was not like uh it wasn't like a big massive factory farm it was kind of a smaller it was this is in the 80s so it was like a smaller little chicken farm and the guy he didn't he didn't have to chase the chickens around either like you know he wasn't chasing the chickens around mm-hmm. and you know he could just go and get the chickens and 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 it was like the, you knew when it was going to happen because all of a sudden there was like this kind of quiet where before there was just this constant clucking sound uh-huh. but when it was a slaughter day there was this quiet over the whole farm so i i agree with you i think they do but know before it occurred right before it occurred yeah, yeah. so they know they know mm-hmm. <laughs> they're like it's it's been six moons <laughs> i just thought it was interesting how it walked over to her <laughs> that's they very knew, cool and it would walk over to her mm-hmm. It was too. It was too much for her. I think she stopped raising chickens after that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's like, oh, this, this is, yeah, this is heartbreaking. Yeah, heartbreaking. Yeah. Mm. Well, so yeah, so next year is going to have a lot going on in it, and uh, I know for myself, my biggest intention is, is is always going to be to grow as much as I can and resolve as much as I can in my past and continue to look at everything that comes up that bugs me and upsets me and try to address it even when I don't like it. Mm-hmm. Resisting my stubborn energy, learning how to go with the flow. <laughs> yeah. And for me, convincing everybody to vote Bernie. Oh God. <laughs> I'm really sorry, everyone. I had no idea. Do your part. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be the voice of reason. <laughs> Be, be the change you want to see. Vote Bernie. <laughs> uh, oh, man. Who says politics and spirituality don't mix? Um, Most people, right? I do. <laughs> I feel pretty strongly about that. It's well, it's funny. I actually... Um, potato, potato. <laughs> I will see political posts, and if I really think they're good, I'll just private message them to Brandon. <laughs> Because <laughs> I've, I've kind of made this like I'm not going to put anything political on my page because I want to be I I I I know people who like Donald Trump <laughs> I I I know people who are probably going to vote for him and I would like them to still keep watching my page still keep seeing what I post because eventually some of it seeps through I have some friends and family members actually who are hardcore staunch conservative Republican Christian followers and they talk to me about channeling now <laughs> See, I, I think that's good and there there i do that in other areas yeah um but i don't particularly care to talk to trump enthusiasts anyhow <laughs> that's a conversation that i'll talk to them it's okay you can talk to them i can talk to them i just won't talk to them about politics <laughs> no I mean, See, if they I can, seriously it, believe that, <laughs> if they seriously believe, what it tells me is you've got some inner issues because you are not seeing how this behavior is not beneficial to anybody. Yeah. Let it alone of, electing a leader that does it. It, it kind of reminds me of, um, did you see that movie? Oh, uh, oh gosh, what's it called? The Apocalypto. Not Apocalypto. Um, 
Apocalypse Idiocracy. Now. Idiocracy. Oh, yeah. I love that movie. Uh-huh. And so uh, if you haven't seen it, if you're not familiar, basically it's the story of these two people. Uh, we've just come up with this new cryogenic freezing pods and we want to freeze our greatest and best so that we can pull them back out when we need them. And so we're set with, you know, in the movie, they're testing it on these two average individuals that are absolutely average, that know nobody. They have no you know, average ambition, average drive, average intelligence, all these things. And uh, then the and program. One's getting out of a prison sentence, right? One is a prostitute, and actually. One, one's a prostitute. And, and one is a, uh, and the other one, he is a soldier. Who's oh, a soldier. Been, That's yeah, right. he's been, he works in the bookkeeping room or some records room because he's like, has no ambition whatsoever and yeah. he's untrustworthy. <laughs> he just yeah. doesn't do anything. Uh, so he never got it promoted beyond that. So these two, they get put in the pods and then the, the project gets scrapped. They get forgotten. 500 years later, the pods open up due to some demolition or something and they come out and all of the world, nobody drinks water anymore. Everyone's like, Oh, you want toilet water? Oh, that's disgusting. And, and everyone kind of talks in this non, some um, Gatorade like thing, right? Yeah. They only drink Gatorade. They only water their crops with Gatorade, which caused a dust bowl, it's you know, killed everything. It's right? got what plants crave. <laughs> right. <laughs> but the best was when it came to the politics uh-huh. and it was like WWF style <laughs> where the president was like a world I'd wrestler. He's a world, world wrestler. He was a wrestler. Yeah. And I so thought it was hilarious. The political because... arena is literally an arena. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i was laughing so hard at that i'm like oh that's kind of totally what politics looks like to me <laughs> it was just cracking me up oh so funny you and know, i remember watching it and going somebody went in my brain and made a movie of what i view our culture as being like <laughs> and then made fun of it the way i would i love this movie i went and bought it right away <laughs> yeah i thought it was a great movie mm-hmm. yeah the, the uh the idea that the the president's going to be a WWF wrestler. That was brilliant. And then later on, <laughs> California adopted a president that was a bodybuilder. Yeah. And now we got Arnie. Now we got a presidential candidate who is, I don't even know what he is, a real estate mogul whose specialty is bankruptcy <laughs> and, yeah. and narcissism. <laughs> yeah. 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 He likes to think his specialty is women and making money. Well, (laughs) his his rebuttal for his his numerous bankruptcy is it was just a good business decision. Mm -hmm. Well, that was what Bush said too. How how is that business decision business decision going to impact the United States? Well, he doesn't care about that. When you when you well, it's gonna what he's gonna do for himself. That's (laughs) right. That's really. That's really what his goal is, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very true. Very true. Well, that's pretty much, that's all I have to say about the winter solstice. <laughs> See that? She talked a little bit about politics. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he forced me. Yeah. He forced me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, well, th- we want to thank you all for listening and we hope you enjoyed today's show. Uh, and check out our interview, uh, first video interview. That was awesome. We haven't done that before, but we're going to bring a lot more interviews to you. Um, also, we'll mention, uh, unfortunately, our, our former co-host, Hannah Neal Perez, won't be with us anymore. We love her and wish her all the best in her private work. And um, Maybe she'll come back and visit us for as a guest role or some guest appearance. Yep, she's going about her uh, solo journey, and yeah. we wish her the best and wish her well. Yeah, and uh, all for all of you, you're welcome to. And we would love to hear from you. Uh, feel free to email us at thecrystalcocoon at gmail dot com. You can join in on our group discussions that we uh, post information about our various podcasts and our other listeners post information. It's really fun um, on the Crystal Cocoon, at, uh, and that's a group in Facebook. We also have the page on Facebook. You can also find us in Libsyn, um, Google+, Plus, Tumblr, uh, and we're on Twitter at Crystal underscore Cocoon underscore at Twitter. And we...